Good evening all, I'm Tab Binding and I'm your program manager. I work for Trada and the Timber Trade Federation and this is week four of the webinar series that runs alongside Riverside Sunderland University Design Challenge. And in week four we're getting to net zero. Tonight we've got structural engineering, the residential, and tomorrow we go into the procurement costing and placemaking with future homes on Thursday and our virtual pub uh, open house on Friday. Your site is Riverside Sunderland. This is the area that um, you will be designing your new future homes to sit on. We're asking you to form teams of four to eight um, to produce an indicative um, um, plan for 100 homes on the area shaded pink but what we want you to do is to design engineer detail and cost one family three bedroom home and this is why this webinar series has come about. As I said I work for um, Trada um, and I would uh, urge you all to sign up if you have not already done so. Don't register here you will not get all the information that you need come to the academic page, scroll down to the orange box and sign in there. That will get you to 63 units and eight modules, an infinite number of wood information sheets and 100 plus case studies. Especially for this competition, we have um, enabled students to be able to look at some of the charter books online. Uh, Robin Lancashire talked about timber frame construction last week. Um, Robert Hairstands talked about off-site industrialised timber construction in week one. Con cost laminated timber has been mentioned a fair few times, but with structure timber elements and the new book Designing Timber Structures, we have the author and the person who made sure it got written um, on our panel tonight. So these are our speakers. So we have Robert, Simon, James, and Beth. And with that, Robert, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tab. Well done. So, nope, this isn't sharing yet, is it? Not just yet. Um, How's that? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm chairing tonight. I'm, um, as you can probably see, I'm not exactly the generation of students. Um, and uh, I'd like to just take you through some of the aspects. I, I do work in Sutherland quite a bit and I'm a conservation engineer as well as a, a timber engineer. So conserving the planet, conserving historic buildings and conserving current buildings, that's um, aspects that I'm most interested in. Now then, oh yes. Yeah, I've been around first Project Thames Barrier, Saving London. So everyone in the Northeast will be delighted that London is safe. I've also done my bit for not exactly saving the planet before we realized how disastrous such buildings were. So do not build is one of the favorite mantras at present. It's simple and it's correct. And it is said that structural engineers 2,000 tonnes of carbon a year. Now, I don't know where that came from, but it's probably pretty accurate. Although I would say there's a plus or minus in front of that, and I'll come on to that. And do not build until we learn how to design in zero carbon. And I'm hoping we'll learn a little bit more about that tonight. So this is the do not build that I'm, you saw the aerial view that Tab just put up, Sunderland, these are some of the tower blocks, we're trying to save them. So if we say there's 15,000 tonnes of CO2 in each tower block, um, this is what uh, I'm working on at the moment, trying to keep these buildings viable. Um, 
timber, yes. Um, it's fantastic, but ideally it should come from local sources. I mean, there are a lot of people that say, look, we should be designing, if we can't do it efficiently, we should be designing in steel and concrete. Now, I think that's a bit of a disaster. We've got to try and use materials that are to hand as far as uh, I live in the country, I work in the country, and we haven't got time. We've got, we haven't got the 120 years life cycle. Just look at the volume of the Arctic, the 2050 on our right, you know, this 2050 target is going to be very late indeed. And most of the timber that's cut down in my neck of the woods in North Yorkshire, it goes to be burned. You know, ash trees are dying. Elm trees, the millions of elm trees were just cut and burned. Beach is not going to survive the climate change. So use it or lose it. Um, ash trees are just dropping like, like, a, like mad around us. All of these sites here, they're all all of this timber is going to kilns. They're not being used. So if we can make use of timber, that's what I would like to do. See timber used and stored in buildings where it'll hang around for the foreseeable future. So here's one job, Sunderland Park Lane bus station. I designed this in 2020. I mean, it's fantastic after 21 years and it's timber. A little bit of steel in there for the structure, timber trusses, timber decking, but there's a bad side, concrete foundations. Concrete, concrete, concrete. So no matter how much good we do by putting in timber in the superstructure, if we don't get the substructure right, it's all all for nothing. We don't end up with a zero carbon building. Here's another one. This is for York's, uh, the park and ride. I mean, it was great fun in the superstructure, but again, when you get to the substructure, oh, we lost it. We were told, no, you can't have timber decking here. You can't have timber piles. That's a daft idea. So that's the problem that I think our industry has that we can say, oh, yes, we've got this much timber stored in the superstructure and we've saved this much on the not using steel, but it's not much good if we've got the substructure wrong. So this is one of the few buildings that we've actually managed, when I say building structures, and it's a timber wharf. Yeah, timber piles in a saline condition Oh, it needed a bit of repair after a few decades, but otherwise it's fine. So that was my introduction, and I'm hopefully we're going to tackle some of these subjects in, in more detail. Um, so I just would like to say thank you very much, Tab, for organising this. I'm certainly going to be nominating you for a uh, Friends of the Earth Award for the local branch. And... Uh, and I'm sure you'll uh, do very well out of this and hopefully be able to convert the whole country into timber design. So I'll leave on that one and introduce Simon Smith, Director, Smith and Walwork Engineers. And he's got some big buildings, but I gather he's been asked to try and bring them down to a domestic scale as well. Thank you very much. OK, Simon. Super. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, so let's uh, share my screen. Screen two. Okay. Right. Um, so Tabitha has asked me to um, talk to you for half an hour about domestic timber structures. Um, so I'm going to do that, uh, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, timber as a resource first, uh, where it all comes from, how much is there. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do with wood, how we can process it, what we can do with it, what sort of elements we can make structurally out of it. 
you know, talk a little bit about using timber as a structural material in terms of design. Um, and then probably the most interesting for you this evening is just talk about uh, three or four different types of timber residential building that you might want to think about when you're scheming your your timber structures. So let's uh, let's see if I can stick to the 30 minutes that we've got. So timber is a resource. Okay, so I would I would really urge you to read lots of stuff. Um, so we used to read it in books, and books are still very good, but nowadays you can get a lot of information off the internet. Um, and this is a fantastic book by Professor Ab Ashby from Cambridge University. He wrote um, some really interesting books uh, about 20 years ago. This one's called Materials and the Environment. And basically he said, look, it's all about concrete. Um, literally concrete dominates by mass uh, hugely in our world. And, and let's get this straight. Um, we won't be able to get rid of concrete uh, for many, many years um, and timber won't be able to replace everything. But interestingly, um, I think um, the sort of things that, that uh, Mike, uh, Mike Ashby told us were, you know, our consumption of materials is, is phenomenal. Um, we are very greedy. And when you plot population growth against um, our use of materials, we're actually becoming more lazy in terms of design. Um, you know, we're, we're using more materials per person uh, per capita than we were, um, you know, um, and only a few years ago, you know, and, and that's got to stop. We've got to be more, uh, what's the word, uh, lean with materials we use, and we've got to do more with less, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and you can see headlines. Uh, one of the headlines I saw the other day uh, in, in the New Scientist was, there is now more man-made material in terms of mass and there is biomass in the world it's quite shocking really um, our consumption is is literally all consuming um, in that book by um, Mike Ashby there is a bit of hope if that makes sense this is a, a really interesting graph about the energy cost uh, over material price ratio so this is giving you an idea of if you get the cost of a material how much of that cost is associated with the energy cost of, of making that material. So as you can imagine, something like steel and cement, um, quite energy intensive production, uh, they, they need quite a lot of energy and that, that, that costs quite a lot to make uh, that material. Um, and you can see here that um, this is a logarithmic scale on the left hand side, but you can see here, for example, that steel um, of the cost of a ton of steel uh, what is that 10 20 30 40 40 to 50 percent of the cost of a bit of steel is associated with the energy the cost of energy to make that so that's good news for things like um timber and and, and brick and stone because that means in the future as energy prices go up uh, the competitivity of if that's the right word competitiveness that's the word isn't it of, of um, the lower energy materials will, will only get better um here you go. So there's some fantastic stuff out there with NASA doing um, all sorts of measurements of forest coverage, you know, and you can see here um, uh, sort of uh, Europe and, and, and a little bit further afield. Um, and you can see how, um, what's the word, um, uh, resource rich we are not in terms of uh, forest coverage in the UK. Um, and do more reading, do more reading. So in 2011, there was a fantastic book called or, or report by State of the World's Forests, and you can gain all sorts of information out of that. Um, you know about about the UK, the EU's forests, um, and if you look there, you can also look at the amount of sawn wood used in the various countries. And the UK, for example, as you might imagine, doesn't use that much timber per capita. Um, so there's opportunity for us to use more timber in construction and still not be that pioneering if that makes sense you know um so if you look at germany um you know they use um what's that about 50 percent more than us and finland goodness that's a good couple of hundred percent more than us um but you can see again there i'm guessing that uk concrete use you can do a bit of research in fact our office of national statistics unfortunately has not got as much funding as it used to and it's um, a bit sporadic what information they do spit out nowadays but you know, concrete use is, is still quite high and we use quite a bit more concrete than we do timber, as you would imagine. 
Um, another, another bit of information here, uh, more recently issued, um, timber is a construction resource. Again, have a look at this stuff and see how much we use, but you know, sawn wood in, Europe, in European production is about 113 million tons, a million tons of, or cubic meters cubed, I should say, a million cubic meters of CLT perhaps. And our softwood consumption, sawn wood in the UK, perhaps 10 million cubic meters. Um, so you can start to get an idea when you've designed your 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 three bedroom family house that you're going to design. You know, with that 10 million cubic meters of sawn softwood, how many of your houses could you design? Um, there you go. So it gives you an idea about the scale at which timber can work in terms of new build, I should say. Um, fascinating fact that I found out that I never was aware of until I still started doing some reading was, did you know that even with only around about 12 or 13% forest coverage in the UK, our forests are more productive in the UK than our cement or steel industry. There's about 11 million tonnes of biomass wood production each year in the UK from our forests. And we only produce about 10 million tons of steel and about 10 million tons of cement, not concrete, cement, don't forget that. Um, and you can see where the various bits of material go. Um, you might also look at this a bit later on and, and see how much timber we actually import as well, by the way, into the UK. We're one of the world's biggest importers of, of wood and wood products. Right, so let's have a quick look at processing. Um, so what can we do with that material from the forest? This was a a site visit I did, or sorry, a mill visit I did many years ago to Austria where they make uh, glue lamb and CLT. And you can see here a, uh, a saw milling factory with the wood literally taken down from the, the hills by the side. And then the logs coming in and getting sawn the waste from those and um, that processing of the logs, uh, firing a, a biomass boiler, so heat and power generated. Um, and then those logs getting changed into sawn, sawn wood kiln dried with the heat from the biomass. And then, and then made into a very, into either glue lamb or CLT um, and a factory process. This is the rate of which material is processed is quite phenomenal. And this is, a, this is an extract from James's book that you might see again in a minute, but obviously you can take that, that raw log, you can peel it or saw it and you can create all sorts of wonderful um, bits of, of, of um, structural product, if that makes sense from a, from a, a relatively straightforward and quite low energy uh, uh, sawn softwood, or, um, all the way through to quite complex eye joists and cross laminated timber or glue lamb and LBL and plywood. So there's, there's a lot of people coming up with some really inventive uses of wood and what we can do with it. And people are even now taking wood and not just using it as a structural material, but combining it with other materials to make it into what I would suppose I call high performance elements, building elements. So that's a ligno trend on the right hand side. That's a, a floor panel that provides not just the structural floor, but it also provides acoustic separation between the units, um, fire separation as well. And there's the, there's the idea that services can also be rooted in, rooted in within those elements. And then on the right hand side, you've got something called Karlsteg, which is a, uh, a timber, a hollow timber cassette using cold bent plywood as ribs in terms of the, uh, the webs and the flanges of softwood. So there's, there's some really interesting um, research going on out there. And for many years, I've been working in mass timber buildings. And I'm very aware that actually some of the timber elements that we use are quite resource um, intense in terms of their use of materials. And we need, we need to put timber buildings on a diet and make sure we don't just chuck loads of material at it, you know, um, just to, to store carbon. We also need to make sure that uh, we use our, our renewable construction resource sparingly. In terms of structural timber, so don't forget, there's some interesting things about um, timber. It's an anisotropic material. It tends to be five to 10 times weaker across its grain than along its grain. So it's similar almost like to a bundle of straws, which you could squash across the section, but in terms of their length, they're quite strong in terms of compression or tension. Um, their strength is affected by moisture. Um, and, and in damp conditions, you can have anything from 20 to 40% loss in strength. Um, defect free, it's a very strong material, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but typically we use uh, materials, um, anything from 16 to 24 uh, for softwoods. 
Um, and we typically design with a factor of safety probably around about three or four, if that makes sense. So, I mean, it's, it's not that straightforward, but very, very typically. There's a direct correlation between strength, stiffness and density. So the heavier a piece of wood, the stronger and stiffer it tends to be. Um, and actually wood is very good at resisting short term loads, um, but it does creep under under some and uh, under long term sustained loads. So it's a it's not an easy material to, to design with as a structural engineer, I must admit. Um, we've talked about the different types of materials, so sawn softwood here. Um, and we have limits, I guess, on the on the sizes of those elements, typically um, uh, to do with a number of things. But one of them is is the kiln drying process, if it's if it's processed timber, and the lengths of timber as well nowadays are, tend to be restricted from anything from sort of four to six meters. But again, it depends on on the source. Um, the principles of timber design. Well, the strength and the stiffness depends, as I said before, on on things like. Um, uh, the density, but also defects present in the timber, uh, the direction of stress, obviously, moisture content and the species of timber. Um, design is influenced also by the size of a timber element, uh, um, the slenderness, the duration of load and how many elements are taking that load, if that makes sense, so load share. And the other thing that you can see a little graph on the right hand side is the principle of engineered timber is if you if you take some timber and, and cut it up into smaller pieces then glue it back together again sort of spreading out the defects you can you can in theory increase its strength and stiffness um so it sounds a bit bizarre but that's one of the advantages of engineered timber but it's not the it's not the be all and end all you know if possible we should use um sawn timber in in, in lieu of engineered timber if we can timber connections uh, we could have a whole discussion about that um, but ultimately, it's a very important aspect of timber engineering uh, that you really need to think about. Um, and this graph here would imply that actually, if you wanted the strongest and stiffest, stiffest connections, you should, you should glue them all. But then actually, that doesn't necessarily create the best timber structure in terms of design for deconstruction. So end of life, you know, if you want to reuse that building in the future. And, and take it down and reuse other elements. If it's all, all glued together, it's very difficult to do so. Right, how are we doing for time? So we've been going 13 minutes. Right, so case studies. Let's have a look at some case studies. Um, there's different types of structure in timber. There's framed sort of beam and post structures. There's what we call platform structures. Um, so typically um, cellular construction, so load bearing walls and um, and they're built up level by level, if that makes sense. And then there's also panelized or volumetric, so prefabricated structures. Um, we're gonna look at a, a, a few examples here. Um, we're gonna start off looking back in time and uh, an architect called Walter Siegel, who, um, who created a, um, a very interesting sort of philosophy, if that's the right word, um, for, for designing domestic timber structures. Um, and his was a post and beam uh, approach, but it was a modular approach working on a 600 millimeter grid. Um, and his idea was based on using common materials and standard sizes. So looking at those first principles of taking what the manufacturers make, what their standard sizes are, and trying to use those and, and, and dictate the architecture from standard pieces. He used bolted connections for, for thinking about reuse and he also minimized wet trades on site. So he was one for raising the ground floor off, off the ground and using a suspended timber floor rather than lots of concrete in the ground, which was what Rob was talking about earlier on. And here you can see the Seagull Close in London. That's a Google uh, Earth view from what you can see there. And there's a series of, I think, um, I can't remember if I've got another slide there. Is that the next one? Yeah, a series of um, 13 homes um, and, and how we built those. And, and you can see here some pictures. In fact, one of them was on Right Move, I think last year and, and on sale for 810,000 pounds, blimey, from a self-built home, fantastic. Um, so let's have a look. And, and his, um, in the 1980s, I think it was a, it was a self-build initiative um, by the local council. I think it was Lewisham that um, supported that. and. In my talk here, there's a video link to a, a D-Zine open house tour of, of the building, which is quite interesting, so do watch that. 
Um, the next um, the next slide here is uh, a Sterling Award winning from nine, 2019 uh, Passive House um, development uh, in, in Norwich, Goldsmith Street. Uh, uh, Mikhail Rich is architects. Um, and I'm sure some of you will have heard of Passive House. Um, do, do look it up, do your reading, read your books. Um, this used a, uh, a panelized uh, offsite method of construction. So, um, you know, uh, had a series of terraced houses, two and three stories um, with a varying number of rooms and bedrooms. And it used something called a Signum timber panelized system. Again, very highly insulated, very, very airtight part of the passive house um, approach. Um, using eye joists in the floor as timber cassettes with services running in them um, with acoustic insulation and then everything clad in brick. And here you can see some some of the prefabricated sort of offsite methods that we used um, uh, to, to construct uh, the building. So there's a load bearing timber wall system coming in with insulation already fixed. And here you can see um, what looks like some open panel cassettes there on the end of the building. I'm not sure why they're open panel. That's a bit confusing. I would have thought they would have been mainly closed panel systems, but um, you can see some information here. And there's lots of scaffolding around. I'm not quite sure why there's lots of scaffolding. I guess that could be to build the brick skin up around the outside at the end. Who knows? Perhaps you could argue that brick wasn't the best way of cladding these buildings. Who knows? And here you can see, um, here you can see there's insulation even on the party walls there as well. I'm not sure if that's acoustic insulation, um, but uh, you can see again uh, the sort of open panel nature of the party walls there, although they could be. Actually, they could even be, um, no, I think they are party walls between dwellings. See the mobile crane used to erect all the timber work. And I think the next shot, you can see a roof panel there sitting on the ground. There's one already suspended above uh, a two-story uh, housing element there. But you can see on the ground there, there's a fully enclosed um, timber panel with its lifting uh, straps there ready to ready to be lifted into position. And those are pre-insulated pre -insulated panels. Next project is um, something called the Yoka project. So this is up in Scotland. This is one of the projects I worked on. This is a seven story, uh, 42 apartment building. Um, and I think, I think this uses probably cross laminated timber. It's, uh, it's, it's as its best performance. In other words, it's, um, it's 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 performing quite uh, it's quite a high performance structure. It's the timber's working quite high hard on this instance. So we've got solid, solid timber cross laminated panels. There's a photograph of the building completed. Um, as I said, it uses about a thousand cubic meters of timber, which sounds an awful lot, but it's um it's um what's that a thousand divided by forty two units? I'll let you do the maths about how much timber that is per unit, but it's um. It seems to accord with around about 30 cubic meters of wood per per dwelling, if that makes sense, uh, a little bit less than that, actually, which seems to be, from my experience, about what is traditional. Um, you can see some construction shots here. There's a lorry down at the bottom there um, with it with waiting to be uh, units to be lifted on. So the CLT was used for floor and wall units and roof units. These weren't insulated, by the way, so the insulation was applied later on. Here you can see an over an aerial shot and then you can start seeing here a cross laminated timber wall. Um, that one's probably uh, 30, 30, 60, what's that, 80, 100, 120 mil thick internal wall there of, of, of timber. And there you can see a bit of uh, timber load bearing wall going in with the, with the brackets ready to take the fixings. So it's cellular construction. And then you have this strange scenario of lots and lots of metal stud sort of loosely fixed to the, um, resiliently fixed to the, to the wall so that the plasterboard can be applied uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but the primary reason, I guess, is because, um, no, that's not right, is it? It's not the primary reason. Uh, but people expect plasterboard walls, don't they? The other reason, if it's a party wall, I guess, is, is because it's providing, um, it's providing acoustic separation, CLT on its own, can't provide the acoustic separation between dwellings. 
Um, the plaster board also gives some fire protection to the CLT as well. And there's lots to learn about fire and, and timber, as we know, probably, but we won't go into that today. Um, you can see here a, an aspect of the drawing showing the cellular nature of the, of the structure that was built. A quick check on time. Um, and you can see some of the, the various very simple platform details that we have in terms of uh, wood screws and angle brackets um, and, and nail plates, if that makes sense, to give us our connections. Um, the key thing to notice here is that we we don't reinforce any of the platforms. So we don't have any expensive details of trying to stop the floors from crushing because they're that bundle of straws, if that makes sense. If you if you remember the bundle of straws, they're horizontal as floor panels. You get the, the, the bundle of straws as a, as a wall coming down on top of them. Uh, that has a tendency to cross crush that bundle of straws. In this instance, we did a lot of calculations to show that wouldn't happen. Lots of brackets. Um, so with the, one of the problems with lightweight buildings is under wind conditions, lateral load conditions, is that you can sometimes get um, tension forces in the structure. Um, so then you have to make sure that you can counteract those with connections. And at, um, and at Yoka, we, we, we obviously had to take account of uh, disproportionate collapse regulations and look at all sorts of different scenarios as a panelized structure to make sure that if any one panel, wall panel, load bearing wall panels was removed, it didn't result in a disproportionate collapse of the building, if that makes sense. You know, it all had to be proportionate. Um, so that was a, a lesson learned uh, in the 60s from the, the, the Roan Point disaster, in which a, essentially a small event, which was a, a, a gas explosion in a, in a single kitchen, literally blew out one panel, which resulted in one whole corner of the building collapsing. Um, the other thing we had to think about at, at the seven story Yoka project was the differential movement. So timber uh, moves over time. Um, that can be for a number of reasons. One, because of creep, which we've already mentioned, but also because of um, moisture movements as well. Um, and at Yoka, we had to do quite a lot of calculations to predict the amount of moisture movement um, and make sure that the timber and the cladding could move differentially. We also, on lightweight buildings, had to uh, do quite a lot of work on the, the potential for um, uh, sway in the wind and making people feel slightly seasick. So uh, we did a lot of work on that. And here's some, a research project with lots of expensive measuring equipment, measuring the, um, the dynamic performance of the building to so try to shake the building and see how it wobbled. Final project um, is, a, is what we call a volumetric project. So this is a something called Z pods that we worked on. This is a, uh, a volumetric unit, uh, a two story unit that used 31 cubic meters of CLT. So quite an intensive use of, of CLT, I must admit. Um, I, think, I think if we did this again, we'd try to get um, the building um, to use less timber. Um, but the idea is that this can be built in a factory uh, and, and, and um, installed uh, fully fitted out uh, from the factory. So you can see here some CLT units um, um, being built in the, in the factory to our design. Um, and you can see them starting to be insulated and made waterproof. And interestingly, I found this fun. Uh, they also make steel versions of this as well. So um, I'm not saying that's wrong at all. Uh, you know, each material to its own, but you can imagine um, there might be some discussions about which is cheaper, steel or timber. Who knows? We won't touch on that today. That's tomorrow. And now you can see one of the top, the top units, the top story um, being taken uh, to site on one of the lorries. And here you can see, um, actually, this is this is the key principle of Z-Pods, the idea that you could take um, brownfield sites such as surface car parks, uh, Tesco's or Sainsbury's, and you could build and hover these two-story elements above on a on a podium steel structure, maintain all your parking, and then live above a Tesco's car park. I'm not sure that's something I would necessarily want to do, um, but there you go. That was that was the one of the concepts. Um, okay, so there you go. Finished building in I think that's Bristol actually. Uh, anyway, um, so a couple of things again. Going back to the reading, 
Um, don't forget to read books. You must read books. This is um, uh, a report by the NLA um, on factory made housing. Timber was mentioned 64 times in that report. Um, cross laminated timber was also uh, quite, uh, quite well featured. Um, and the whole premise is they're manufacturing buildings instead of constructing them. We won't have any more construction sites. We'll have manufacturing or assembly sites, if that makes sense. And then the final thing is on the factory theme, I'm gonna ask ourselves, where is the factory? You know, is, is, is the factory a traditional factory uh, that's built in one location and doesn't move? Or does the factory move around the country with the buildings? One of the challenges I have on my timber jobs is when we're building timber projects is they get wet during construction and we get concerned um, about moisture being locked into the timber. If we build anything in, um, in Scandinavia, they insist on building everything inside a tent so their factory is actually on site. So there you go, that's something for you to ponder. Where is your factory? I think with two minutes to spare, that's me finished. So I'm gonna hand over now and stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hand over to James. Thank you, Simon. Right, I'm just gonna hopefully share my screen. Um, has that worked? Can everyone see? Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, Simon, thank you for that. That's so many good thoughts, so much to, to, to think about. I, I, I'm just gonna kind of pick up probably very much where you left off uh, and, and I'll try and reference a number of things that you've already talked about. Um, so my name is James and um, for about 12 years, give or take, uh, I, I used to be a structural engineer designing buildings. I worked for Rambo, uh, where, where Simon actually used to work. And, and then I worked for Integral Engineering Design. And then six years ago, I, I left industry and became a full-time academic. And I've been teaching people uh, how to design buildings um, ever since. And, and so um, that, that's my, my plotted history. This is my favourite building that I worked on, uh, and, and it's my favourite building for a, a, a huge variety of reasons. Uh, I, I think it's actually a really nice building, but it's also a, a sick form centre at my old secondary school. So I have personal connection. Um, I, I love the way it looks. It's a, a, a timber frame CLT building, uh, and it's really near where I live, so I get to see it on an almost daily basis. So, so I have lots of good reasons for, for loving this building. Um, it was designed by uh, Field and Fowles, who um, uh, are, are a, a really nice architect practice. If you haven't come across their work, do check them out. And, and Fergus Fielden, who designed this building with me, also went to this secondary school before designing the building. So uh, I, I think we def both definitely played that card quite strongly when we were interviewed for the project. Um, so, so the, the school liked that fact. Anyway, so yeah, I've designed all sorts of different things, um, but, but this is probably my favorite. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about um, conceptual design. How do we go about doing that initial design process? But before I did even that, I just thought I'd start with this illustration, which you would have seen drawn lots and lots of different times. Uh, hopefully, if you haven't seen this before, um, do, do go and have a look for it. It appears in past 2080, it appears in, um, uh, you know, kind of lots of different articles. I think I just found it in Letty as well. And you, you see it built over and over. And it's about the, the, the impact you can have on the amount of carbon in your project um, from the, the, initial, the initial beginning of the design process and, and kind of um, that, that decision to build nothing, which, which I'm a huge advocate for and a huge fan of, um, right through to kind of building less, building clever, building efficiently. So, so this conceptual design phase, I think the thing we have to understand is the conceptual design phase, this kind of early moment where we have loads of different ideas and we throw things around, that's where the biggest impact is in terms of achieving uh, net zero or, or, or at least minimizing the embodied carbon in our structure. Uh, and so th this bit of the, the, the design, it, it, it can happen very quickly, but actually it's worth getting it right and it's worth taking time to get it right. Uh, and as Simon said, you know, it's worth actually preparing for this moment so that you can get it right. You know, re read around, know what you're trying to achieve, know what you're, what you're about. Because my experience in industry is this moment happens over a few days often. Um, it, it, it can happen very, very rapidly when you get there. So, so being well prepared for it is important. 
So I just wanted to talk to you about the 23 decisions you need to make uh, at, at the kind of initial concept design stage. Uh, and I, I, I'm being slightly flippant. Uh, so um, there aren't actually 23 decisions. And, and as you can see here, I've actually only listed eight. Uh, but the reason I've done that is because these are not the only eight decisions you'll be making. That you'll be making all sorts of decisions all at the same time. And, and there are all these different interrelating in, uh, consequences of the decisions we make. And they're not sequential, these decisions. They, they, they literally all happen at once. Uh, and so whilst I'm gonna talk about eight, there are actually loads more. Uh, so I'm talking about it from a structural engineering perspective. So I'm gonna be focusing very much on the structural decisions that get made, but there are loads of other decisions that get made at the same time as well. And all of these things interrelate, they all happen simultaneously. They're, they're, then they're, they're not sequential. And I think that's the thing I really want to emphasize. I could have put these in any order uh, and hopefully later on in this presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll take a bit of time explaining this process and how it, it does happen and how it can uh, occur in almost any order. So before I get to that, um, I, I feel like, and, and, I, and I never quite nailed it, but I feel like this, this moment, making all of these de decisions at once, is a little bit like throwing up everything in the air and grabbing it all at the same time. And um, the closest I could think of was, was the old circus trick with cigar boxes where you kind of toss them all up into the air and then you rearrange them. And then as, as they come tumbling back down, you, you kind of grab hold of them all, all, and, and in the order that you want them. And, and it really is that kind of chaotic maybe is the right word that you know it's not an ordered process it's a very very rapid process uh, and so knowing what's going on with all the different elements can be quite challenging but also quite exciting and because it's it, it's quite an interesting space uh, I've actually worked quite hard over the last couple of years to produce a, a number of resources to help people um, to make these decisions uh, and and uh, once we, we finish talking, I, I'm, I'm happy to pop links to, to these resources in the chat. Uh, and, and the really good news is that Tabitha has worked really hard to make sure that two of these resources are available to you for free right now on the Trada website. If you log in as student, um, if you log in as students, uh, so structural timber elements and designing timber structures are both there for for you. Um, conceptual design of buildings is, is the third book and. And that was published with the Institute of Structural Engineers. So if you are um, a student or, or if you work for a company and you um, have uh, the construction information services, then I believe this should be available to you through that. Uh, and, and if you're not, then you can buy it from the iStruct website. Now, all of these books are, have elements of trying to help you make the right decisions right at the very beginning of, of the design process. And, and I think it's probably worth just pausing here because, um, when Simon introduced um, himself, what he didn't mention is, is, is that he actually had this brilliant idea. So for, for years, there's been some really good books for concrete and for steel design that help you do the initial conceptual design. And um, he, he wanted to create a similar book for timber. And so when I became a full-time academic, Simon sent me an email and said, look, I've, I've wanted this book to exist for a long time. Uh, now you've got very little to do. Now you're an academic. Um, maybe you'd be up for writing it. And, and I, you know, at, at the time I, I thought, why not? So that's how Structural Timber Elements came to be. And it's the idea is it's a guide on, on the initial sizing of timber structures right at the very beginning so that you have a, a similar tool to those that exist for steel and concrete. Um, and it's a brilliant book, by the way. <laughs> thank you, Simon. Well done, James. Thank you. Um, the, the next one is conceptual design of buildings, and that is not a timber book. It's, it, it's about conceptual design of buildings um, much more generally, and it covers everything from initial concept uh, design, uh, design um, brief development, uh, drawing right through to how to write a really nice stage to report. Um, but, but what I did do, uh, which, which I, was very intentional, is I included timber in there on an equal footing to other materials like steel and concrete, which, which again uh, it was designed to help people to think about the palette of materials they're going to use and broaden that palette. 
uh, and I'll be referring to, to that, that book. The third book um, is Designing Timber Structures, which has only just come out. And actually a lot of what Simon was talking about in terms of the material uh, properties of timber, the fact it's anseotropic, the fact that it's like a bundle of straws. In fact, to, for the, in the writing of the book, I glued together a whole load of um, straws just to make this very point. And so this is my pretend block of timber made up of paper straws. Um, so, so yeah, so that one there is, is more aimed at the detailed design process. What, what happens next? Once you've decided you've got a timber frame building or a CLT building, how do you actually approach the design process? But, but I'll be referencing all of these as I go through the rest of my talk, just, just because I, I'd love for you to have these tools to hand and be able to use them in, in, as you go through your project. So I'm gonna, all crumbs. From time to time, my mouse disappears, which is really unhelpful, okay. So the, the, the eight different decisions that we need to make simultaneously, all at the same time, all at once. The first one is what kind of foundations are we going to have? And we talked earlier about the importance of foundations in terms of if we're going to try and achieve net zero, then, then the foundations is where a lot of the concrete is going to go. Even in a timber frame building, the concrete, it, we're going to often have concrete in, uh, in the ground. So what are we building on? What's, what's the grade ma ground made from? Um, what types of foundations do we want? Do we want pads? Do we want strips? Are we expecting to use piles? Um, if, if we're using uh, columns, then we're probably going to have something that looks more like pads. If we're using walls, then we're probably going to have something that looks more like strips. This is a, a gross simplification. And, um, uh, and I know I have to be really careful talking about geotechnics because um, foundations require very, very careful design. And, and it, it is quite a complex space. Um, and and I'm a, I, I have a habit of oversimplifying it, but but essentially that that is a good place to start. Uh, and do we want to try and achieve concrete free foundations, which which is something that I'm really excited about, and and I'm really looking forward to Beth talking about it. And actually, it it happens quite a lot in other parts of the world. So in the UK, it may not be the norm, but but as I understand it, um, in New Zealand, they use things like timber piles uh, quite regularly. So so actually, the, these these things uh, need to be thought about. Um, so that's just one of the many decisions. Uh, and the next decision that you might want to make is materials. What are we going to build our building out of? Um, is it going to be steel? Is it going to be concrete? Is it going to be masonry, glass, earth, straw, FRP, you know, you name it. Um, recycled cola bottles. I, I don't know. There, there are so many different choices. And I think one of the things I'm excited about and passionate about is enabling structural engineers to have a, a, a much bigger palette of materials available to them. Uh, and I know that on this project, you've been strongly encouraged to use timber, but even within timber, what's it going to be? Is it going to be sawn timber? Is it going to be eye joys? Is it going to be um, what I've become started to call ULT because Unilam is uh, apparently a trademark term. So ULT is, is just like CLT, but, but um, all of the timbers go in the same direction. Or is it going to be CLT, cross laminated timber, or Brett stipple, which is um, a quirky material, or you can Google it, or glue lamb, or LVL plywood OSB. You've got so much choice. We're spoiled for choice. And even within, um, so even if we're going for timber, we, we've got so much choice. Uh, and one of the things I would strongly recommend is to pick a small subset. The, the good design um, is, is rationalized and actually avoids over complicating things. So we might have sawn timber floors and walls with plywood and OSB. Uh, or we might build a, a glue lamb and CLT frame, or we might use LVL, uh, laminated veneer lumber, um, both for, for walls and for, for slabs and for beams. Um, so there are lots of different options, so we need to pick one. Okay, so that's the second decision we've got to make. So we've got to choose the foundations, we've got to choose our materials. Next, we've not got to know uh, how far the material can go. And, and this is one of the ones which I, I think is really critical and the reason I say it's really critical is because often as a structural engineer, you'll get given a project and someone else would have already decided that the column grid needs to be nine meters because it's an office space. And we have to have columns at nine meters in an office space because of the desk layout or whatever it might be. And then you get asked, well, can it be made out of timber? Uh, and actually, the answer is probably no. So, so actually, the, the person who decided that, the, the, the decided to put the, the grid at nine meters, you know, decided that the floors should go nine meters, has probably excluded a number of possible 
a number of possible options without even realizing it. They, they've probably forced us towards particular material choices. They forced us towards particular structural solutions without even realizing it. And one of the things I, I um, am really keen on it is, is kind of getting people to think about spanning less far. Uh, I think five meters is a really good number to aim for. It can be shorter, but, but I think we're addicted to kind of going long and we don't need to go long. I, I, I don't know how often you walk into an office and you go, gosh, I'm really glad uh, the columns are at nine meter centers rather than five meter centers. Uh, I, it, uh, it doesn't bother me when I walk into an office how far apart the columns are, to be honest, uh, as long as it's sensible. And it, it, but, but we have this desire for these big spaces, which, which actually exclude a number of material choices. And so this, this is a page taken from Structural Timber Elements, which starts to give us an idea of how far different types of material will go. And not just how far, but also the, the, the icons mean things. So the hammer means it's more likely to be used on site, whereas the, 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 the cardboard boxy type is, is suggesting it's better for pre prefabrication. Uh, the house means it's probably good for, for, for resi. The, 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 the three-story building means medium rise and the multi-story means high rise. I, th these are not hard and fast, they're just suggestions. Uh, they're suggestions on how long it will last in a fire. So uh, sawn timber doesn't have a very good fire rating. So you might wanna consider fire boarding uh, and also acoustics. And we have to be aware that acoustics is a challenge for timber regardless of what solution we use. Um, and then there's things like lead in, how long does it take to, to actually get these products from designing them to, to being delivered on site? So there's all of this information which I've, I've tried to include in this diagram to help engineers and designers think about what they would like to do. Uh, and then the next question is, okay, so I, um, I, I'm designing my building. I know that I want the spans of five meters, but how deep should the floors be? Do they need to be 150 mil, 200, 250? Uh, and, and so this diagram here is to help you work out how how deep your 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 floors need to be whether it's sawn timber lvl clt unilam i've tried to cover all the different options um for roofs for walls for beams for columns the, the, and that's really the bulk of the book uh, and so this helps you to really quickly make decisions uh, and then because i wanted to do a better job than the, the than they did in the concrete and the steel books i also have highlighted to you what is probably going to be the governing design consideration so if it's orange, then it's probably going to be governed by vibration. If it's gray, then deflection. And if it's blue, then it's probably governed by bending, which then helps you as an engineer know where you need to go next with your design. So if you're used to designing steel and concrete, you probably would jump to doing bending checks. If you're designing for timber, then deflection and vibration are often the things that are going to govern your design. So I wanted to kind of alert you to that fact so you didn't ignore that, that information. Uh, and then there's a, a very useful little um, a comment at the, at the very top of that diagram to say if you've got beams of beyond six meters then yes they might structurally work but are they available can you actually buy them in the UK from from your supplier uh, and so and generally the answer is no so you, you you should be very careful about using sawn timbers at lengths greater than six meters and I think um, Simon already mentioned that Grid spacing, so that just follows straight on. If I know how far my spans of my floor plates can go, I can start to think about if I've got um, columns and where my columns should go, if I've got walls and where my walls should go, how far apart should they be? Uh, and, and, and again, but these things are all interrelated. Uh, we then get to a structural system. So is it gonna be framed? So beams, columns, and floor plates, or is it gonna be load bearing? So walls and floor plates. And if it's load bearing, is it gonna be platform as Simon mentioned earlier in his talk, or is it gonna be panelized where we prefabricate panels and bring them onto site? Uh, if, it's, um, if, if neither of those work, maybe it's a hybrid, a bit of both. Maybe we need to use generally load bearing, but in these areas, uh, we need some big open spaces. So we're gonna use beams instead, you know, so we end up with a mixture of both. Uh, and what about stability? How do we make sure that when the wind blows, the whole thing doesn't just fall over and and not just the, the wind, uh, the robustness that Simon mentioned. How do we make sure that our building is, is robust and, and, and sound? Uh, and so all of these con considerations are covered. Um, and there's, you know, I, I could I could speak for the whole 30 minutes on just a small part portion of that. So so dive in further to that information. But starting to think about these things is good. OK, next thing, prefabrication. 
do we want to prefabricate? If we do, how by by how much? Are we just prefabricating the structure, or are we prefabricating more than just a structure? Do we want to attach services? Do we want to attach insulation? Do we want to do it just by walls, or do we want to do whole modules? Do we want to deliver the entire? Um, you know, like the, the the project that Simon showed us near the end. I'm imagining they're delivering whole units in, in one go on on that project. Is that right, Simon? Yes, that, that's right, James. So these, they, they literally could, in theory, deliver them with the, uh, the furniture inside. They don't, obviously, but the, the white goods, the fixed goods are all, all yeah, that's correct. So, so but that, that then creates a whole load of other constraints that we need to think about, which might influence other parts of the design. So, so resolving all of these things, it all happens at, at the same time. Um, insulation. Now, uh, generally, I'm not an expert on insulation, but I, I've thrown this one in particularly because we can get very worried about the size of our timber studs or whatever it might be. But actually quite often, if the insulation needs to be say 300 mil to achieve the U value we want, you know, we've got Brian part, um, not Brian, we've got the building regs part L and, and to achieve the U value that we need to achieve, we need quite a lot of insulation. It may well be that it's not even structural things that are governing our design. It might be other considerations that are governing our design. So. So the amount of insulation required uh, in the walls or in the, the, the roof, uh, and that doesn't include things like acoustics, which Simon mentioned earlier, which you need to think about as well. So there are all these different things that, that come into play. And then, of course, probably the most important thing and, and, and kind of the, the driver for this is the, the embodied CO2 in our structure. Now, I, I think we have to be really careful because I don't believe it's possible to build and not release CO2, certainly currently. Um, it, it, it just isn't possible, but, uh, but I think we can reduce significantly the impact of, of the work that we're doing. And I think too often we don't really think about it. And actually something that's really worrying me at the moment is, is that there's almost this mindset of, well, our building would have been 300 kilograms of CO2 and we've, we've saved 3% on that. So actually we've done a really good job. Uh, and I feel like we need to reorientate ourselves. You know, if you build nothing, at, and you just carry on using the, the, the buildings that you've already got, then, then you're at zero. So as soon as you start building, it's going to have an impact. Uh, and we need to start thinking about how do I get this number right down? How, how do I get a number of, say, 100? And I, I drew this a while ago. The iStructure have since released an article on this very subject, which, which doesn't quite match my ABC rating. Um, but, but, but I think the principle is the same. How do we kind of get to a point where we're having as... as as small an impact as possible and almost I think um, engineers need to start thinking about ethics should I be designing this building does this building need to exist uh, and they need to understand that there's a cost to the work that they do uh, and maybe the good that the building does maybe the, the what it achieves outweighs the cost but I think we should be thinking about that rather than just ignoring it so those are just eight of, of the 23 different things that you might want to think about. Now then, I, I'm gonna try in 10 minutes to show you what this process looks like. And I'm gonna, mm, sorry, I'm humming to myself because I can't, my pointer has disappeared. Okay, I've got it back. Um, I'm wondering if I can change my camera. Well, yes, I can. Okay. so. I'm hoping now that rather than my face, you can see my bit of paper. And I, I'm just gonna be, I've got all, all three books here and I'm just gonna be showing how we might use some of those to do some of this design process. So let's say we start with this aim of targeting 100 kilograms of CO2E per meter squared. Let's, let's say that that is decision one made, okay? Uh, and that's gonna have a whole load of knock-on effects. So these things all happen at once, remember. Um, so knock on effect one, I, I, I'm pretty confident that you will struggle to achieve 100 kilograms of CO2E if you design this out of steel or concrete. Um, and there's a really nice um, study that the Bureau Hapo did that, that looked at the different materials. And I, I think currently the material that's most likely to achieve this, this 100 kilograms of CO2E is timber. So I, I, by going for the, that CO2 limit, I've had a knock-on effect. I, I basically said I'm, I'm building out of timber. And I could have chosen a variety of different types of timber, but um, I believe that you guys are being encouraged to use CLT. So I, I've gone for CLT. Now, I want to target five meter spans. So 
Um, I'm, I'm thinking, ah, and, and I could have targeting five meter spans, spans of floors, CLT. So CLT works comfortably between three and seven meters and five is a good, five is kind of a good point. As you push up to seven, it, it, it's working quite hard. It gets quite chunky, okay? So suddenly I, I'm, by, by thinking about CLT, by, by saying I'm targeting 100 kilograms, I'm actually thinking short spans, five meter spans. I'm also thinking in, in terms of my grids and, and, and structural depths. I'm thinking, okay, CLT, five meter spans. I'm probably looking at 160 CLT floor plates and I'm starting to get a sense of, okay, so I'm probably gonna have walls or beams or columns at roughly five meter grid. So I'm starting to create this grid system for my structure. Um, I'm also suddenly going, okay, well, it's CLT. So that's probably gonna be load bearing. So we're, we're probably gonna have a series of walls uh, and slabs. So we're, we're probably in this sort of ballpark where, where it's load bearing and we've got walls and slabs because that's generally what how CLT works best. And then we say, okay, well, that means we're probably using strip footings. And actually, if we really want to target 100 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared, we, we, we're going to try and get rid of the concrete in our foundations. Uh, and, and, and the real problem with concrete it is, well, there, there's a few we could discuss, but, but it's the cement, uh, which Simon alluded to earlier. And, and it's the, the, um, both the embodied energy in producing cement and also the CO2 that's released as cement is, is manufactured. The, the chemical process itself releases cement. So, so we're going to try and go for concrete free footings. Okay, now, now all of these things have all happened simultaneously in my head. They're, 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 they, they all happened at once. And, and actually, I could have gone in a different direction. But let's keep going with this process. Um, CLT means that we're definitely going to have prefabricated panels because CLT is factory made. So the panels are by definition going to come prefabricated. Now the degree of prefabrication well, that's up to us. We could go further. We could say, I want to prefabricate entire units and bring them onto site. Or I want to install the, the finishes and the, the, the services onto those panels before I bring them to site. That, that, that bit is up to us. But there's definitely going to be an element of prefabrication just because it's a CLT uh, panel. And then in insulation and envelope, well, that's going to be outside the timber. So it's not going to be like a stud wall where we put the insulation between the timber studs. Uh, it's going to be insulation on the outside of the walls. It's going to be insulation on top of the, the CLT up on the roof. So suddenly we've got all of these pieces that have fallen into place, all because we made one decision that we wanted to target 100 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. And so I think that's quite exciting, but I think it's also potentially a little bit, um, it's a little bit scary. Uh, and so I've put this in big red letters. You can start anywhere and it impacts everything. So, so I could have started somewhere else. I could have said, uh, I'm going to start with my prefabrication. I, I'm going to start by saying this has to be prefabricated and that automatically makes a whole load of decisions for me. Or I could have said, as I said earlier, I'm going to start with a grid system of 12 meter spacing or, you know, six by nine or, or something like that. Or maybe I start by saying I want it to be a load bearing system. Or maybe I start by saying it's got to be uh, concrete free foundations. Maybe that's where I've started that decision process. But each time we make a decision like that, it doesn't just make a decision about that item. It has a whole load of knock on effects. Um, if, if you're a certain age, as I am, you'll, you'll remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, and in many ways, it's a bit like that. We make a decision and it has all of these knock-on effects that we need to be aware of. But, uh, and, and this is really, really, really important. Don't panic. Uh, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's, not, um, it's, it's not the case that if you make one wrong move, you're kind of out the game. I would say it's the opposite way around. Actually, these decisions are really empowering. They help us to move forward with our design. So if we say it's going to be timber, that helps us to then move forward and make a whole load of other decisions. Actually, this, this is a really good thing that if we make some decisions, it helps us to move forward. It gives us that, that impetus. It helps us solve all sorts of different problems. And, and, and the aim of the, the, the design team is not to do this process once. It's actually to try a few different solutions and to see which one works best. 
So, so you know, actually don't just come up with a design, but try and as quickly as possible do, do a number of designs and look at, um, you know, what's the embodied carbon in my solution? Which one has got nearest to the number I first thought of? Or maybe you want to try looking at which one has got the, you know, the least amount of material. So Simon alluded to the material efficiency and actually how can we drive down the amount of structural material in our building? You know, which one of our solutions is, is, is most efficient? Uh, so the idea of doing things quickly isn't that it's, it's, it's really high stakes that if we, if we make a bad decision, we've got to throw away all of our hard work. The idea is that this process actually, when you get used to it, takes a matter of hours, it may be even minutes, um, and you can end up with some, some really good solutions which you can then compare and contrast against each other and, and persuade yourself that the design you've got on the table is the best one, it's the right one for this particular problem. Uh, and I think that is my last slide. And I, I'd minute, finish with one minute and 30 seconds, although I think I hit my timer just after it started. So maybe I, 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 I'm, I'm up to 30 minutes. I'm now going to stop sharing if I can get my pointer to appear um, and pass on over to Beth. Thanks, James. I will just get my slides all started sharing. It doesn't look like you stopped for it yet. Oh, no, that's your camera. I see. Righty ho. Hopefully you can see that title slide and not the, my notes, although there aren't any, but yeah. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so a little introduction about me. I'm a structural engineer. I'm associate at a small consultancy in Bristol um, called Build Collective. And, and I'm a certified passive house designer as well. So I do um, low energy um, timber frame buildings. That's a lot of what I do, new builds and retrofits um, from a sort of house size scale. So just moving on a bit, this is the sort of um, projects that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, small domestic um, size things up to a sort of new build house size. Um, so I've done about sort of 15-ish passive house um, buildings now and other low energy buildings, ACB building standard you might have heard of. Um, yes, and so what I'm talking about today is domestic, which is sort of relating to what you're doing as your, your um, competition, um, but also applies to other scales of buildings, all different scales of buildings. So looking at concrete free foundations, um, so as James said, this is a, one of the key decisions to make in your uh, design process. Um, so we'll have a look at, I, I want to talk about sort of some, some different options, mainly we'll just look at some options that might be appropriate, but then also how you might decide on what option is appropriate for your site. And so some situations where they might, they, these um, design solutions might be appropriate and some where they might not. So first things first, just to build a little bit on what James was saying about design decisions there. Um, so what is a foundation? So in fundamental terms, it is the part of the structure that transfers the loads above ground from the above ground structure, the superstructure into the soil. So then to design the foundation, um, we need to know the loads from the superstructure, which is all of what James and Simon have just been talking about. Um, and then we know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the ground beneath our building needs to be capable of resisting all of those forces that our superstructure is putting on the ground, including the odd ones, which are usually timber specific, like the wind loads, the racking loads, um, and the ho holding down loads, uplift loads, all those kind of things, um, which we get into with timber design. So here we go, those couple of things. So before deciding on a type of foundation, you need to be looking at the, these couple of things. We need to be looking at the loading capacity, loads of our superstructure. So um, what type are they? Are they area loads? Are they line loads? Are they point loads? Do we have a wall building? Do we have a frame building like James was just talking about? Um, some foundation types work better for wall building, some work better for frame buildings. Where are the loads, the distribution of them across the layout and how big are they? What kind of scale are, they, are we getting? Um, if your loads are large, like a mini piling system is not gonna be the way to go, but um, there are other op foundation options. And then also one thing that's um, particularly critical with these kind of um, slightly odd um, type of uh, solutions is what deflections are you allowing in your superstructure? We design a lot of our deflection criteria on, on um, 
on brittle finishes. So having things like plasterboard um, on, a, on the inside face of our structure, because that's sort of what's expected as Simon was saying. But um, if you don't have brittle finishes, then potentially you can allow greater deflections in your, in your foundation solution, which might then lend itself to a slightly more unusual foundation solution. It's just something to be thinking about, particularly if you're designing the rest of the building, what kind of, what effect your finishes will have on your foundation solution. And then once you've gone through all of the stuff from your superstructure, um, where, where, are you, where is your site located and what are the geotechnical um, conditions on site? Um, so this is the area that I work in, which is Bristol and Bath area, which has got all sorts of weird things going on in the, in the geotechnical area, which is great fun for designing foundations in that area. Um, so yeah, so my advice, go to the Go to this um, website that I've got on the screen here, but the British Geological Survey. Um, they have great maps of all of the UK. You can see um, what's going on in the ground conditions. Just a rough idea um, to see what's what, what's going on on your site. Um, so then for, for this talk, I'm going to highlight a few different types of those geotechnical considerations that are going on um, in uh, that will most most likely be on your site. So what I'm going to talk about mostly is um, these sort of classifications. I'm going to break it down. There's obviously loads more to geotechnical engineering than this. Um, but um, so first of all, is your site on rock? Do you have rock very close to the surface? Is it cohesive? It's, it's soil before it's broken down into small particles. And then granular soils, they are sands and gravels and silts. Um, so soils with little to no clay content. Um, and then you've got cohesive soils, which is essentially clays generally higher plasticity, they move around a lot over the seasons, um, something to consider when you're designing foundations. And then a couple of other considerations from a site perspective, are, are there significant trees near your site? Um, and do you want to keep them as part, of, that's the main thing, are they, are they there and then are they gonna stay there? Um, and do you have neighboring buildings, particularly masonry ones that can limit some of the um, foundation options available to you? So other things that might be critical are made ground, um, slope stability, the, the mining, quarrying, there's all sorts of things, um, which is a really interesting subject in itself. So I just had a quick look at your site that you've got in Sunderland. So just on that area, you've got options of, of rocks, you've got sands, you've got clays, you'll obviously have lots of neighbouring buildings, there might be trees around. So there's, there's lots going on in the ground um, that's worth considering at an early stage and before you choose a foundation solution, before you get your heart set on something. So now you've got the idea from the structural design perspective, um, let's have a look at some different options that might be available to you. Um, this list isn't exhaustive um, and I'm not giving any new technologies. There's, there's loads of options out there and um, yes, yeah, so it's just have a Google and see what you can find. So we'll start for um, as James mentioned, the, the, um, the foundations generally fall into a couple of types. They're, they're generally either shallow foundations, so usually less than um, three metres below ground level, usually like strip foundations, pad foundations, rough foundations, they're all types of shallow foundation. And then deep foundations, carrying the loads to deep below the, the uh, surface ground of the ground, so usually greater than three metres, and, and the primary example of those is piles. So we'll start by looking at um, shallow foundations and go through some options here. So starting with the traditional, um, if we look at historic buildings, they don't have concrete foundations. Obviously buildings have been around a lot longer than concrete have. Um, so uh, usually historic buildings will just have the, the brick or the stonework in this country directly laid onto the formation in the ground. And, and that can be applied today. That's obviously physics is still the same. Um, so you can, yeah, you can build masonry straight off uh, the bearing strata, given that you've got um, sufficient load bearing capacity in the foundations. Um, I'd say this approach is best suited to buildings which look like traditional masonry buildings. So more wall than window to avoid large point loads and an even loading profile all the way around the perimeter of the building to avoid differential settlement. You'll also want an even ground profile across your whole site, again, to uh, avoid differential settlement. So it, it can be tricky to design point loads um, from this, mainly from the sort of masonry coursing perspective, it's difficult to course masonry out to large areas um, and to, uh, to get a significant load spread across the area. Um, 
So any point loads would need to be spread across a wall area, I'd say, which could take, be done by a ground beam, for example, to spread the load across a larger area. Masonry also doesn't take uplift forces, tension forces very easily. So this um, solution isn't going to work if the superstructure requires holding down. Um, so, yeah, so, um, so I wouldn't recommend this site on a on a this on a site that has um, significant trees, because the trenches um, would need to be shallow enough that somebody could safely get down into the trench and then build um, from from ground level. Um, if the trench is deeper, you generally need temporary propping, um, which on a sort of you know, a domestic scale doesn't get done that well on site. So it's just generally best to avoid it and make sure you're designing something that is safe for the types of builders that you're, you're aiming for. So then limecrete. Um, so this is probably the most concrete like replacement option um, and can be used in a situations where the concrete compressive strength isn't the governing design criteria. So you've got a sort of, there are different grades of um, limecrete and in a similar way to, to concrete comes in grades. Um, it, so limecrete is, um, it, it's, it's, it's got a different hardening profile to concrete. So it, it can be very variable in how the compressive strength turns out um, after your 28 day or whatever day design strength. So um, yeah, so that's a, the, an NHL 15, uh, five, mix might give you between 1.5 and 9 newtons per millimeter squared bit capacity depending on the mix um, and then also lime creek can be uh, the the hardening and the strength uh, the design strength can be significantly altered by the amount of water that's in the the gets into the mix during curing so you need to be very careful at, um, whilst it's curing that it's protected and that you leave it for long enough that it can reach its design strength um, but other than that it's um is an option um, yeah, some sites. Another option um, of shallow uh, spread foundations would where the concrete compressive strength isn't the governing design criteria is compacted fill trenches. So in the same way that you would add fill underneath it, like a ground bearing floor slab or something. Um, again, as with masonry spread foundations, I wouldn't recommend these um, for deep trenches because you've got to get in there and you've got to compact the, the fill. Um, but, it, and again, you want an even lo loading profile around the perimeter of the building to avoid differential settlement. Um, the one consideration about this is, particularly with domestic buildings, um, is that if some if somebody comes and digs next to your foundation later on um, in the building's lifetime, if somebody comes to do an extension, for example, um, how is that fill going to stay cohesive um, in, in the place that you put it and it did underneath your building? Um, so options for that are some people add binders to the to the fill which is essentially like a lean mixed concrete so or you, you but you can add lime binders as well if you're trying to avoid the the cement um and or you can uh, like in the picture here you can add a geotextile membrane around the sides of the trenches to contain the fill but again those geotechnics those membranes have a design life so just making sure that you're picking the right product for for your situation John Butler pictures are on screen has a really great blog about his his ventures into concrete free foundations on that. So other options, there's a couple of options for using um, tires. So some information about the car tire waste um, industry. Um, car tires can't be sent to landfill. So if you're looking to reduce the waste that would usually go to landfill, you want to use tires of a greater diameter than 1.4 meters. So like tractor tires. Um, uh, but if you're looking to reduce the amount of waste that's burnt, um, car tires generally in their, they get sent to waste to energy, so they get burnt. Um, so if you're looking to avoid that kind of that kind of uh, use at the end of life, then you might be looking to use car tires. So for car tires, they work quite well in in this kind of situation shown on screen. So they can be essentially pad foundations, and they're filled with um, compacted fill. Um, they usually on um, sites with good ground conditions, so um, good bearing capacities at shallow depth, so something around about 100 kilonewtons per meter squared. So that there's um, some some options on that. Um, they can be designed for an uplift capacity, which is what's shown in the picture there. So they they've added steel plates top and bottom of the of the pad to mobilise the weight of the of the the tire and the fill to hold down your building. Um, I've also seen um, gabion baskets used in this in this manner. So 
yeah, there's other options for foundations. And then if you're going to use, um, so car tires, um, another option might be they they get bailed at the end of life, um, or they can be bailed, and then these are often used in big civils works as sort of bulk fill material. But they've got a they've got a bearing capacity for those those bales, and you can use them as a compacted fill under foundations. So they could be used to, for example, reduce the amount of imported fill that you have under a, a raft foundation, for example. Um, or so to improve the quality of a, a ground that is potentially poor at shallow depth. And then, so um, another, other options that I've seen for sort of shallow foundations are these kind of nail plates. Um, they're essentially sort of metal plates that go in the ground and then you drive soil nails through the little holes at various angles. They're quite common for um, steel agricultural buildings. Um, so yeah, they, they're a good option. They, they're, so they require some kind of suspended um, ground floor system to tie all those pads together. And then as you can sort of see, they work quite well for framed buildings because they're, they're a point foundation, which is good for point loads from a frame. Um, I wouldn't recommend them on sites with um, clays and, and significant trees because um, they don't deal with um, clay volume change very well. There, there isn't really a solution to deal with that. But, but um, yeah, granular soils or clays with limited volume potential or no, no significant trees around would be a good option. And there's quite a few manufacturers doing those kind of things. And then we, here we're going to take a little detour into things that aren't technically foundation solutions in themselves, but might help you reduce the amount of concrete in the foundation um, on your site. They're generally used for larger sites, so could be used for housing development sites um, to reduce the foundations across the area because they're, they're quite big and heavy civil type work, so you need a, a reasonable area to make them cost effective. So vibro compaction being the first one, it essentially involves ramming a vibrating poker into the ground to wobble loose granular soils um, into a denser configuration. It only works on granular materials, so gravel, sand, silts, it doesn't work on clays. Um, it's not recommended near existing buildings for obvious reasons. Um, the vibrations don't work very well with the existing buildings. Um, but yeah, so you can, but, they, but it is like a cost effective method for large sites to improve the ground bearing capacity at, at shallow depth. And then a similar option, which is used, can be used on um, clays, is um, vibro stone columns. So it's a similar idea. Um, vibro, um, vibrating poker into the ground, but instead of wobbling the ground itself, you add imported um, sort of gravels and silts into the into the ground to to then compact those, and then that forms like columns in the ground, so almost like piles, and um, that then you would have a ground beam system uh, between to sort of tie them all together. And then another option for clays is lime stabilization. So this is a chemical process where you add a, a layer of a lime or quick lime to the surface level of the, of the ground, and then it's rotated in as per the picture here. Um, so it, it permanently alters the properties of the clays, similar to the reactions in cement. And the reactions are long-term and the strength can be continued to game over, over a number of years. And then potentially another option, although maybe slightly less permanent, is um, uh, using geotextiles to reinforce um, soils underneath. You could, it's often used in civils works, so abutments and that kind of thing, but could be used underneath buildings. Um, you've obviously got a, a design life on the, on the geotextile, so that should be taken into consideration when you're designing it. And if you're aiming for something potentially greater than 60 years, you might want to think about how that might be achieved. Um, yeah. So then moving on to deep foundations to finish up. Um, so yeah, piles essentially. Um, so there's a few different categories of piles. Um, a couple I'm gonna focus on today are driven piles and screw piles. Um, technically these are both dis displacement piles. So the soil around where the piles going is displaced rather than being dr drilled out and removed. Um, so yeah, we'll go on to that today. So, a common one for um, particularly if you're looking at like domestic scale reducing the amount of concrete in foundations is um, screw piles. I haven't found a large number of sites where I can use them on to be honest um, but that's probably to do with the weird and wonderful geotechnical area of Bath and Bristol than the problem with the product itself. Um, so they're friction piles so the capacity is derived from the friction of the soil against the the shaft of the pile. They're not a bearing pile, so they don't 
they don't take the loads down to good ground below, below the ground surface. Um, so they the screw um, uh, sort of uh, setup um, helps them need less length to achieve the same capacity as a standard friction pile. Um, they come in around a maximum about six to eight meters, depending on what your site access is. Um, and you can get hand installed versions which are shorter and you sort of just screw them into, into the ground um, as a sort of low tech option. Um, one thing to be careful of is if you've got clays on site that have a high volume potential, um, they don't come with it. I, well, I haven't seen them come with a sheathed option, which you would want um, for the sort of top section of the pile if you were in clays with, with heave potential. Um, so I'm not quite sure how they deal with that in the design process of them, but um, yes, so that's something to consider. Another small pile that I personally my favorite type of pile because engineers have to have one um so is a is a ductile iron pile um so iron has a higher ductility than steel so these uh, piles can be driven using a higher uh, rapid stroke um, lightweight um hydraulic hammer so they're a low vibration installation so they can be used near existing buildings so um, direct down to about 400 millimeters away from existing buildings um the the um, iron tubes come in five meter lengths, um, but then they have a socket joint at top and bottom. So you can drive one section into the next, and then you can create much longer piles from short sections coming to site. Um, cast iron is more durable um, than steel. Um, it will oxidize faster, so it will rust faster, but the rust stays on the surface um, and the st structural integrity of the pile is, is intact. Um, I've crossed out rock on the on the list there. You'll see that probably on a lot of these piles because if you've got rock close to the surface, there's not really much point in piling. Um, if you can get down to the rock by just digging a trench or something, um, yes. And um, but they can be installed as as end bearing piles onto rock at depth if that's the site conditions. And then driven steel piles, similar to um, the ductile iron piles, but they don't come in sections. So you have to, if you need a long pile, it has to come to site in the full pile length required. And therefore you need good access to your site. And then you also need big plants to be able to install them. And they, they need heavier weight drivers. So you can't install them near existing buildings, particularly masonry buildings. That said, you can get steel tube piles, which are waste pipes from the oil industry. Um, so well as being a, a waste product, which is reused, they're higher grade steel than general structural steel would be. So they're quite useful for, for contaminated sites. Then probably another popular option, timber piles. So it's not, a, they're not a new concept. Venice is built on timber piles and has been around for quite a while. Um, and they're a good uh, popular option from an embodied carbon perspective. Um, for appropriate structural uses, as with steel piles, they're driven it with too great a load to allow them to be installed near, near neighbouring buildings. But also with steel piles, there isn't scope to join the timbers together within the single pile. So the timbers would have to come to site at the required length. And then going back to what James was saying earlier about sort of the length of practical length of timbers available, you might be limited in if you're looking for UK timber to sort of five, six metres, you can get longer piles if they're imported um, from Europe or Canada, um, maybe nine to 12 metres, but um, that's a sort of practical limit on a, on a pile. So um, you might find that that is your limiting factor um, on whether this is an option where you can get the timber from. Um, from there are UK installers, as Rob showed um, in the in the beginning of, of timber piles, often in marine applications. It's quite popular for it because it's particularly durable in that environment compared to steel and concrete. So as with any timber structure, good detailing is going to be the key to making sure that your timber pile lasts as long as you need it to. Um, so the most at risk junction is going to be the junction between the air and the ground. So if you can deal with that um, area by using potentially small amounts of concrete or, uh, as in the case of Venice masonry, um, and provide access for maintenance and inspection, then there's no reason why your timber pile couldn't achieve a 60 year design life or greater. Um, obviously, and then depending on the, um, the specification of the, of the species of timber as well. This picture here is from a, a, a timber bird hide that I did an inspection on the on the piles of down in Somerset. So that one's 15 years old. I think they were they were old telegraph poles, the piles they used there. 
Um, so yeah, if you want more information on timber piling, I'd be looking at the marine engineering um, and, and those kind of applications. That's, that's the most common um, application of timber piles in this country. And often they're using um, imported hardwoods um, just for that information. So then final one for particularly for urban sites is um, do you need new new foundations at all uh, looking at that do you need to build um, are there foundations on the site from previous buildings that you could use um, I don't have time to go into that subject to, to, today because there's a whole whole load of information you could um, get on that but there's a really great um, BRE guide um, on the subject particularly in urban sites and uh, how you might inspect and assess the capacity of existing foundations on the site so from an architectural point of view, if you're looking, if I'm not entirely sure whether your site in Sunderland has, but if you're looking at other sites, you would want to be wanting to design your um, new building to have a similar loading profile to the building that came off the site. So you'd be looking at where their loads came down, were they point loads, were they line loads, all of those, all of those considerations, and then trying to design your new building superstructure around that loading profile. So that's all from me. So yes. Yeah, so sort of sum up um, things to remember what are the loadings from your um, superstructure are they line loads point loads how big are they where are they um, do you have any uplift um, uh, can you be flexible on the deflections that you're allowing and then what are your ground conditions on site have you looked at the BGS maps and um, what what rough ideas have you got um, are there any borehole logs nearby that you might get a better picture on on the on the capacities and the build-up of the ground um, what, what's surrounding your site, the site context, where are there existing trees, buildings, um, contamination, mining, made ground, all those kind of things. And then looking at shallow and deep foundations, what are your options, which one of those are you picking, and then looking into more detailed options. So that's all for me. I'll pass back to Rob, I think, for questions. Well, that was great. Thanks very much indeed. Yes, thanks, Simon, James, and, and Beth for brilliant. Um, and I think now, questions and answers. Well, on that very last one, reuse of existing foundations, that's the one that I've been knocking my head on most. Trying to persuade people that a, I mean, as a conservation engineer, you can have a massive machine bed and they, Structural engineer will come along and say, oh, no, we can't possibly use this. I mean, it is extraordinary. And one of the big advantages of timber is that on the whole, it's light. And it's any old foundations that we've got on site, if you're putting a timber frame on it, it'll be much lighter load than what was there before. So for students listening, this is a very good point that Beth made at the very end. Look at the historic maps, find out what the buildings were, then you can use the footprint of the old buildings, which will probably be there if it's in Sunderland, especially if you're on the uh, some of the sites that uh, uh, have been reclaimed from really heavy industry. Um, and, and that might be a fantastic way to win an award. <laughs> Use somebody else's foundations. So, um, questions. Can I start with, does ULT equals DLT or NLT? I think that was Simon, wasn't it? I think, it, I fear it's me. Okay. Uh, uh, and it's... Uh, NLT, I, I have to confess, I had to quickly Google them. Uh, NLT, NLT stands for nailed laminated timber. So that's where you have um, lots of timbers side by side and you basically nail them together. Whereas DLT stands for dowled laminated timber, or, or I've come across the phrase brettstapal previ previously, which is where you have a series of timbers and then you drill holes through them and you put a, a dowel. And, and actually, as I understand it, certainly with brettstapal, the, the dowel is normally hardwood, whereas the timber is softwood. Uh, and what happens is the, the differential shrinkage of the timbers mean that the dowels lock into place. So you don't need any glue at all. The, 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 the change in, in shape of the two different materials locks them together, which is a really nice idea. Uh, uh, and if you're interested in, in that, then uh, my old company, Integral Engineering Design, they did a, a project called Cody Brennan, 
um, which is spelled, I think, C O E D dash Y dash B R E N I N. Did I get that right? I'm really bad at spelling in yeah, English. Yeah, I think, I I think so. Well. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, Google it. It's a great project. Really nice. But that uses Brett Staffel. Now, in my mind, ULT is, is any. It, it could be glued, it could be nailed, it could be dowed. The, the point is that all the strength is in one direction. So you're putting a series of, of uh, timbers all aligned in the same direction. The, the obvious advantage is, is it's stronger than CLT, but there are big, some disadvantages too around um, distribution of loads. So it doesn't distribute loads around openings, for example, uh, or not very easily. Uh, and, and also around shrinkage. So the, the behavior of the timber, one of the reasons for putting the timbers in two different directions is you get much more dimensional stability in your timber. Um, so yeah, so I, I hope that that answers it, it for everyone. Um, you standing for, for what? You, 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 well, it's really uni lamb. So uni, one direction, one direction rather than cross. Yes. Uh, but but we, we I wasn't allowed to use the term uni lamb because it's trademarked. So we we I debated it with a number of friends um, over email, uh, and we did, we landed on ULT. But it's it's not an industry standard yet. But but I'm hoping it'll take off. Thanks very much indeed for that, James. But just on the dowels one, you said hardwood, but I mean it, it's very common, or it used to be common that you use dried dowels in wet timber so if you're using if you're constructing a um i mean i'm tending to go for the for the big beams out of big pieces of timber uh yeah you'd you'd use dry dowels so it has the same impact that the timber then when it dries it then compresses around the the dry or pre-dried dowel I but, but I think the, the critical thing is you're not using any glues and you're not using any any metal fastenings either. So, so it's a really nice way of, of, of creating panelized systems um, just using purely timber. Um, right. There was a good question here, which we might just bring in. Um, would replacing a steel concrete building with timber building save more carbon? assuming that the old timbers were recycled. Hmm, that's, I'll, I'll take that one, shall I? Um, yeah, I do. So, so is that, I guess that's for a situation where the building is already existing and we're taking that building down and replacing it with a timber building made out of recycled timber. I think that's what the no no re is. no taking the building down and recycling the steel on the concrete. Ah, right. Okay. That's how yeah. I read. It. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so that's an interesting one. Um, I think going forward, I think one of the things that's clear to me that any new build is a big investment in carbon, if that makes sense. Um, so we really need to think about end of life, and I think the future will see more and more that buildings, whether they're built out of concrete, steel or timber, people will be designing structural components that can be dismantled um, at end of life and either stored away for future reuse or reuse straight away in another building. You know, we, we need to start thinking about buildings as being, uh, you know, you, you pay for a new building, you shouldn't have to pay for someone to demolish it. You know, in fact, it's an asset, a building, you should think about a building as you build it and then actually if you ever wanted to move out of that house and and um and, and sell it on someone could buy it to either live in it or buy it to dismantle it and put it up somewhere else you know or reuse it somewhere else you know so i think that's an important thing i think it's also important to say that timber is not the right material for every structural solution out there you know that really isn't and there'll always be uh, other options available um and we, and we shouldn't just be bashing steel and concrete because they have um, very good properties and they've been used for many years, yeah? Um, so, so I think, I think um, the first thing is, is don't take the, the existing building down because try and reuse it. If you have to take it down for whatever reason, make sure you take it down sensitively and, and try where possible to, to reuse those elements. Is that, yeah. That's great. 
I mean, I, I was in New Zealand if, and was gobsmacked. Moving house in New Zealand has a new, <coughs> has a different meaning. In New Zealand, they have timber sections or whatever they call them. They're the houses. And when they're moving house, they just pick the house up, put it on the back of the lorry. And so whenever you're driving along in the New Zealand roads, you are overtaking somebody occupying three quarters of the road with their house. It's fantastic. Um, unfortunately, that's not what we're doing in this country at the moment. Uh, one of my neighbor's houses has just been demolished because it's they're going to build bigger and better. I mean, I tried to oppose it, but and that's what we're facing at the moment. Um, in fact, I have, yeah, I've, uh, this is a, a common thing that I'm being asked to do quite frequently. Can you condemn this house because we want to build something slightly different? Uh, and it's hardly going in the right direction. So I, I, I would just like to say two things. Number one, I love this question because it, it shows a, a, a different approach to thinking. But, but number two, I, I think fundamentally, I, I would not demolish a building, but because actually if you think about it, it would be better just to put all the, all the timber underground than, than demolish a building and build a building out, out of timber. But, but actually we want to be using our resources as wisely as possible, which is where I think we should be thinking as much as possible about using all the existing buildings we've got but where necessary when we build, how do we absolutely minimize the impact? Uh, and, and how do we use wisely the materials that we've got? Um, so so I, I, I love Simon's thing about, you know, actually just calculate the tonnage of your, your structure. Could it be lighter? Could you be more efficient? Does it really need to be as heavy as it is? You, you know, and, and keeping a record and saying, okay, next time we do it, could we do it better? Uh, I think those are really good sentiments. But, okay, but, but I, whilst I love the question, uh, don't demolish j just to build something else in its place if you can help it. J James raised a really interesting point there about um, put the timber underground. <laughs> and some of you will be scratching your heads and about what the hell is that guy talking about? So let's just look back at the forest and see how productive they are. There is a, um, there is a school of thought and, and some will dispute this, that when forests grow, um, they will reach a point at which um, uh, they're no longer absor absorbing CO2 and, uh, um, and, and they are not being as an effective carbon store. Um, and in fact, plantations are another discussion point altogether. So James's point is perhaps, well, let's just plant lots of trees, keep them growing, and then get that carbon they've locked into the, into the wood and put it in buildings or even underground. You know? So, so that's, a, that's another school of thought that actually all of this available wood, we should be cutting down as much as we can and replanting as much as we can because it's a very good what do they call it? Carbon and capture uh, program, you yeah. know. Um, so that's that's big picture thinking, isn't it? And that's government level, sort of global level thinking that that really is quite interesting. Simon, that's that's pretty well my view. As I, I'm saying that as well. Um, it, it's not really the institutional structural engineers and Bath University are, are arguing the opposite. That no, you're much better off not cutting trees down and not. But the trees around me, they've all got to come down for some reason or another. And um, yeah, I mean, if you take something like ash, I think that perhaps the optimum time for cutting an ash tree down is about 40 years, because after that, the pith in the middle of the tree starts to decay. So you can actually, it gets harder and harder to use the timber after that, because you're, you've got a, an annulus of sound timber. So, I was just going to say as well, I think it depends on um, also where you're drawing your line of, around what is saving carbon. You probably could make an argument for knocking down an existing building and building a timber one in terms of the embodied carbon if you're replacing like for like. But given that sort of 80% of our um, carbon in buildings is used during the lifespan of the of the building, if you're if you're making a if you're making knocking something down to make something that is significantly more efficient, potentially that might incur in terms of the, the difficulties of retrofit and, and that kind of thing, you might you might be able to, to make something like that um, work. But it's um, yeah, that it's it depends on where you're drawing your your boundary. Obviously, you don't get yeah, you don't get the benefits of sequestration and, and then the, the burning until the end of uh, we're looking at the whole carbon lifespan. So um, you've got to sort of think about those. All, the, all in the whole lifespan of building. 
while you're on Bethany, I agree with that totally. No, dead right. That's what I was thinking as well. Are timber piles durable for long periods, 50 years or more? Well, yeah, I just point to the example of Venice, still um, sinking for other reasons, but but it's um, the piles are still there. Um, so it's a matter, like I said, it's a matter of detailing, and and it's the same with any kind of timber structure, any any element of timber in the structure. If you detail it well, you can make it last, and if you if you specify it well as well, choosing the right um, the the right um, species for the job, the right treatments potentially uh, surface treatments for the job. Um, yeah, like I said, a lot of um, the piles, timber piles in this country are imported hardwoods for the length of timbers that you get and also for the durability, but um, there are other options. And um, yeah, I saw a really good example of, I think that was probably somebody from Bath University, again, with them, with timber piles with a, with a precast um, concrete header on, on them as, as well. So sort of looking at the options of making those kind of as, as, as precast units that come ready with the concrete section that sits between the ground and the air, which looked really interesting product. Yeah, I must say this the one I showed early on with the um, uh, park and ride in York, that was on a, um, a refuse tip. So we were expecting the ground to shrink away from the building. So my concept was rather than try and have to build, keep building the ground up, you just cut cutting off the top of the um, timber pile and jacking the building down. <laughs> so we had a constantly move, shortening pile. <laughs> it, it was a lovely idea, but everybody said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> no way is a very frequent um, stop, unfortunately. We're all sitting around having all of these great ideas. But in the real world, there's an awful lot of engineers in projects uh, who are going to say, no, nah, I don't like that. We want concrete. We want steel. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think about 50% of our projects, we get booted out because they don't want to have a low carbon solution. Why should they? Yeah. So more questions. Tab, do you want to come in? Because I haven't, um, have you noticed anything? I'll, I'll add one in whilst we're on the subject of timber piles that somebody asked about. Um, are there engineering design regulation and building certification relating to the use of timber piles in the UK? Oh, uh, yeah, it challenges. I thought, uh, yeah, I read the question slightly wrong. I thought you were asking about whether design criteria codes for that. Yes, they, it falls under the building regulation, uh, under the Euro codes, and if you're using British standards and all that kind of stuff. But um, Yes, it, because uh, like Rob was just saying, the, there's a lot of subjectivity to engineering that sort of people think it's a black and white and it's a numbers game, but there's a lot of what would you, what would the engineer accept on their PI? What would the building control officer accept? And and those are usually the challenges to, um, to doing uh, alternative foundation solutions and alternative structures in general um, is, is those kind of subjective sort of decision-making points. So um, there's a question here, would dowel lamb then be harder to deconstruct than metal? Oh, I see what they, yeah, sorry, deconstruct. I just read the question. I don't know whether anybody had said anything. The question was, I suppose, if you're putting the dowels into this laminated timber, is it going to be harder to deconstruct? Um, it's difficult to imagine that people could actually take laminated timber to pieces and, and reuse it. Uh, that seems I wouldn't know why you'd want to, really. Um, no, you'd probably be better off keeping it intact yeah. and using whatever reason. Yeah. If I had a piece of laminated timber, though, in my back garden and I was tasked with pulling it apart, I would much rather take apart a piece with dowels in because I could just saw through the dowels very quickly and easily, whereas as soon as you put metal fixings or glue in, actually, they're, they're, they're so much stronger than the timber that, that it actually becomes much more difficult to separate them uh, and even to the level where if, if at the end of life you're going to burn the timber for, for for energy purposes you know the dowels would then just be part of that burning process you wouldn't have to worry about any nasty fumes you wouldn't have to worry about getting all the metal out first uh, I, I would have thought it'd be the other way around that the, the, the timber dowels would would although I'd rather keep them as panels if you wanted to split the timbers apart the, the dowels would make it easier rather than harder I that's just my gut feel based on hmm. I would, challenge, um, 
I would also say to any student, I challenge you to take apart a timber pallet that's been nailed together with ring shank nails. It is, it yeah. is amazing how, how uh, effective some of the nails are. The, the screw and nail technology now that's been developed for timber is in one respect fascinating. Um, you know, it really is quite amazing what our manufacturers have developed. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I see that a lot in, in comparing people comparing nails to um, screws to get out. But I think even trying to take a screw out that's been in a building for 60 years, I mean, whether you're going to get that out, at least the nails you can sort of you can pull out eventually. But the screws obviously got the shaft, there's the, the thread that goes in. Yes, I think there's a there's a lot of sort of rose tinted glasses on how easy it is to get metal fixings out of timber after 60 years, even 120 years, if you're looking to you know, introduce the the embodied carbon yeah unless it's oak of course <laughs> i made a lovely oak front door and the uh, the screws um uh just dissolved within two years yeah. you have to use brass yeah um, simon uh which fe finite element package did you use for the clt example you showed yep yeah, so um so basically the challenge with uh, CLT is it's a very difficult material to model instructional analysis packages because it's not just the, the unit of CLT itself, it's the connections as well. Um, so modeling all of that together is, is quite tricky. Um, so I would say when you're doing 3D analysis of, you know, of, of CLT structures, be very, very careful of what you analyze and what you input. Um, I did put in the chat, there is a specialist piece of software from Germany uh, for um, analyzing CLT structures in 3D. You can get around it by making up your own plate elements in FE, but typically speaking, we design CLT buildings as a series of uh, components, you know, like a wall and a floor, and we just design each of those in, in, in isolation, if that makes sense, uh, using um, various spreadsheets that we've developed ourselves. You can even get CLT um, you know, design software off, off the internet. Um, but actually James's book, Structural Timber Elements, uh, gives you some really, really simple advice on, on span to depth ratios, but also graphs saying, if you've got a five meter span, perhaps your CLT is 160 or 180 thick, you know, depending on the loading. So just, just use that at this stage. Don't get into finite elements. If, if you're using finite elements to design a CLT building, blimey, you'll probably, um, making things far too complex i don't know that's wrong no no that's not wrong but but yeah i must say i'd always thought that but um yes mm. that, i'm i'm older that's the problem <laughs> right i um yes we've uh, almost reached the time to bring tab back in um Anything else that anybody's noticed? Please, the speakers, any of the questions? Just notice Ellie's um, clarification around design for deconstruction. I, I, I do think that's really important. And Ellie, apologies if we mis misconstrued your, your previous question. Uh, and and it, it is something that the engineers are thinking about more, but, but I don't think know if we, how many of the answers we have. My only real experience of the, this is, is um, my, my friends at Integral design a bale house, which is a straw bale prefabricated building at Bath University, um, but it was a research facility, so it didn't have planning permission. Um, and, and so it, it was only allowed to be on its location for five years and the, the university decided they liked it, but they didn't want it to stay where it was. So they dismantled it all and moved it about 200 meters to a new location and rebuilt it. And it all seemed to go very well. So, so, so actually, thinking about connections and thinking about deconstruction and reconstruction is, is, is really important. In fact, I think it's essential uh, as, as we go forward. Um, but, 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 but at the same time, I think there's probably going to be some mistakes made along the way because we, we haven't done it very much. It's not, it's not in our, it's not normal practice for us. We tend to demolish, you know, rather than deconstruct. And, and I think that until we start changing that, we're not going to learn the lessons that we need to learn. No, no. That's, that's a very valid point, James. And the, the, the whole deconstruction and circular economy is in its infancy, in my view. And um, there's a lot of people claiming their buildings are deconstructible and they're they, they not. And, and there's a, I think you've had Rotoblast on here. Um, they have some fantastic um, uh, manuals of different connections and they've got these bizarre 
connectors for CLT, you know, panels, which you think, blimey, that looks like lots of lots of um, lots of effort, you know, to try and connect um, timber panels together with metal brackets, you know, that are, uh, you know. But you can see actually that they are moving things forward, and you can see that there could be almost a situation where they develop connections where you can bolt timber units together, a bit like an IKEA flat pack, you know, a bit of furniture. And you can start to see how very easily it would be to um, literally deconstruct a building, um, uh, you know, like an IKEA piece of furniture is. But then having said that, sometimes IKEA furniture is awfully difficult to remember how to deconstruct. But anyway, that's a different. Yeah. Well, just look at this, Simon. As you can see in my camera, I don't know how many people are looking at the videos, but yes, I mean, that's these beams here are old. Mm, they they all are. come from. So that's my house. They've all come from an old, a friend's house that was demolished. <laughs> so my, my, my belief is that, yeah, if you've got big chunky timber, even if there's a fire, it won't burn and uh, it'll be there to, for somebody to, uh, to reuse later. Yeah, I, was reading, sure. I, I was reading some stuff about reuse of timber this week and um, one of the things that where the research seems to be lacking is in the um, grading of use and, and, and older timbers and um, we our grading um, regulation is all based on new sawn um, green timber so how we grade um, older timbers that have been in use um, so that would be something for research if you're interested in going into that to, to look at that I think there's some people in America looking at it but not much in the UK. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, especially oak like these. I mean, how do you grade a timber that's absolutely rock hard? Yeah. What a fantastic evening, Tab. Well, thank you all. And yeah, on that regrading of timbers in situ. Yeah. So some of my colleagues at uh, um, in B Entrada, they, they do that day in day out and um so yeah that is there but i'm sure there's lots more research to be done so yeah so on that note yes thank you robert simon um james and beth um we couldn't put this on without our sponsors so i'd like to thank the confederation of timber industries akoya Rotherblass, who you just mentioned, um, the Timber Decking and Cladding Association, PEFC, the ASBP, you mentioned insulation earlier, Wood for Good, and if you're looking for homegrown timber, BSW. Taking you back, this is our site in Sunderland, and this is the site for these hundred new homes. Um, this just gives you a different, you know, puts it into perspective. You can see the big, um, the big drop off down to the river. And we're looking at it just on the Vaux housing site on the pink area. And it's the indicative um, plan for 100 new homes, but the one home in detail. And that was one question I wanted to put to all, all you engineers, but maybe once we stop recording. Tomorrow, if you haven't yet booked your tickets, come and join us for procurement, costing and placemaking, uh, where we will have another fascinating in-depth look at how do you procure um, timber buildings. And then on Thursday, we'll look at future homes. And if you've got enough stamina, come and join us on Friday in our virtual pub. Um, so this is the wrong slide. I knew somebody to put up the wrong slide. It had to be me. And uh, this is almost the end of our four week series. If you haven't yet signed up to participate, please head to one of our partner websites. So that's Moby, um, Trada, or our sponsors, uh, the Confederation of Timber Industries, because all the information is held there.